In this lesson, we're going to look at normal distribution and actual scores. We're going to be using normal CDF again, where we have a lower score, the higher score, and then the mean and the standard deviation. But remember, in our last lessons, we've been dealing with z-scores, so our mean has been 0, and our standard deviation has been 1. This is not the case when we're dealing with actual scores. We're going to look for the mean and the standard deviation in the question. Now, here's example 1 where we can see what I'm talking about. It says record for an airline show that its flight between Frankfurt and Montreal arrive on average 5.4 minutes late with a standard deviation of 1.4 minutes. Assume that this is a normal distribution and find the percentage of flights that arrive A more than 8.2 minutes late, B less than 4 minutes late, and C between 2.6 and 6.8 minutes late. Alright, so for the first one here we can see in our question on average, 5.4 minutes late. Standard deviation of 1.4 minutes. Well, right there, they're telling us that our mean is 5.4 and our standard deviation is 1.4. Let's have a look at our diagram. So if we draw the normal curve, we can see our mean right here, 5.4. Right? Standard deviation just means how big our intervals are, but we want to look at more than 8.2 minutes late. Well, 8.2 would be maybe somewhere over here, and more than 8.2 minutes late would be everything shaded above 8.2. So when we use normal CDF, my minimum score is 8.2, my maximum score is E99. My mean is 5.4, and my standard deviation is 1.4. Put this in the calculator and see what you get. So go into second distribution, normal CDF, and putting in what we have here, 8.2, comma, E99, comma, 5.4, 1.4. Enter, and we get 0 0.0228. So they're asking to find the percentage of flights that arrive. So if we want to change that to a percentage, you multiply by 100, and you get 2.28%. All right, let's see what that means for B. Now we've got less than four minutes late. So if we did this one, 5.4 is the mean. If we're looking at four minutes, that would maybe be around here, four minutes. So if we shade this area, We want to know what that probability is or what that area is in that shaded region. So normal CDF, my minimum would be negative E99, my maximum would be 4, the mean would be 5.4, and the standard deviation is still 1.4. Okay, put this in our calculator. negative E99 4 5.4 1.4 enter we get 0.1587 if we're rounding that all right change that to a decimal would be 15.87% so that means 15.87% of the flights arrive less than 4 minutes late. 2.28% of flights arrive more than 8.2 minutes late, so that's pretty good. Now what about between 2.6 and 6.8 minutes late? Well, 5.4 is here, 2.6 down there. 
and 6.8 would be somewhere up here. Great. So shading all of that area. What is that area in there? So we've got normal CDF. My minimum score is 2.6. My maximum score is 6.8. Looks like I lost a decimal there. 6.8. And then you're still putting the same mean and standard deviation for this case. I'm going to let you put that in your calculator. You can hit pause on the video if you want. Check back with my answer. And you should get 0 0.8. 186 and that would be 81.86 percent so that means a lot of flights 81.86 percent of flights are between 2.6 and 6.8 minutes late all right let's see a different type of example and see how this might change example two it says iq tests are sometimes used to measure a person's intellectual capacity at a particular time IQ scores are normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. I'm going to highlight that right there because that's my mean and my standard deviation for this question. If a person scores 119 on an IQ test, how does the score compare with the scores of the general population? Okay, well, that's right. My mean is 100. My standard deviation is 15. And they're giving me a Z score. Well, it's not a Z score because we're dealing with actual scores. So a score of 119. So how does 119 compare with what we're doing? So let's draw the diagram. So we're no longer dealing with Z scores. We're dealing with actual scores. The mean is 100. So 119 should be somewhere over here. And we want to know, right, it says, how does this compare with the general population? So what percentage of people have a score less than 119? Okay, that's what this is asking. So that would mean we would need to find the area under the curve up to 119, right? So all of this shaded region. So this is going to be another normal CDF question where my minimum is negative E99, my max is 119. In this situation my mean is 100 and my standard deviation is 15. Punch that in your calculator and see what you get as an answer. You should get an answer of 0.8974 or, if you want to know the percentage, that would be 89.74%. So that means 89.74% of people have a score less than 119. All right, let's take a look at example three. Athletes should replace their running shoes before the shoes lose their ability to absorb shock. Running shoes lose their shock absorption after a mean distance of 640 kilometers with a standard deviation of 160 kilometers. Zach is an elite runner and wants to replace his shoes at a distance when only 25% of people would replace their shoes. At what distance should he replace his shoes? Okay, well this question's asked a little bit different. We're going to see what that means for us. We know there's a mean distance of 640 kilometers standard deviation of 160 kilometers. But we're not actually being asked to find the percentage of people. In fact, we're given the percentage. Okay, So if we're given the percentage, that means that we know the area. So we've got our mean of 640, a standard deviation of 160, and an area of 0 0.25. Well, whenever you get a question, you write out what you know, and you're trying to figure out what you don't know. So what don't we know? At what distance should he replace his shoes? So we're actually finding what his score is. We're finding his value along the curve, given the area. 
So we're actually using inverse norm on this case. So just because we've been doing questions up to now where we're finding the area, finding the percentage, doesn't mean that they can't switch it up on us. So when you do a test, when you do an assignment, when you do an accountability check, when you're looking through and reading the questions, make sure you understand what the question's asking us to do. In this case, given the area. So what would the curve look like? Well, it would look like this. We'd have our mean of 640, and we're finding what is the area that would be 0.25. So 0.25 would be a quarter of our curve. So a quarter of a curve would be here, right? that would be an area of 0 0.25 or 25 percent of people. So if we do this inverse norm 0 0.25, a mean of 640, standard deviation of 160. Put this in our calculators. Remember when you go to inverse norm you're going to the distribution menu 3. So we're putting in 0.25 640, 160. We'll get that. He should replace his shoes after 532 kilometers. Because this gives us an answer of 532.08. So if we're going to approximate that, we can say he should replace his shoes. after 532 kilometers. Example 4. For entry into the Canadian Armed Forces, the standards used for height are set at 158 centimeters to 194 centimeters for males, and 152 centimeters to 185 centimeters for females. Assume that the heights for males and females are normally distributed, with means of 176 centimeters and 163 centimeters and a standard deviation of 8 centimeters and 7 centimeters respectively. Are these two height standards equivalent and explain? So first of all, let's distinguish our data here. So we've got the male data, we've got the female data. So it says here 158 centimeters to 194 centimeters for males. I'm just going to go through and do all the data for males. Um, heights for males and females are normally distributed, means of 167 centimeters, standard deviation of 8 centimeters. So that's all of the data for males. If we look at the female data, we've got a range of 152 centimeters to 185 centimeters for females, with a mean of 163 centimeters and a standard deviation of 7 centimeters. So what we're going to do is we're going to find out what percentage of males are eligible and what percentage of females are eligible and then we're going to compare those two because if those those two percentages are the same then we could say yes these height standards are equivalent but if they're not then we can say that no they're not so for males if we did normal CDF our minimum would be 158 and our maximum would be 194 with a mean of 176 and a standard deviation of 8. Right? Now what would that look like if we drew the curve? A mean of 176, a minimum of 158, a maximum of 170. Oops. 194. And then this would be the shaded region. For females, same idea. But because we're not using Z scores, we don't know how these compare. So we would have 152 to 185, right? We have 163 as our mean and 7 as our standard deviation. So this is the image for males and here's the diagram for females. 
a mean of 163, a min of 152, and a max of 185. Okay, so put both of those into your calculator and see what you get for results. For males, you should get a result of 0 0.9756, and for females, 0 0.9411. Now if we look at that data, you can see that that would mean that more males are eligible than females. Therefore, 97.56% of males are eligible and 94.11% of females are eligible. The original question says, are these two height standards equivalent? Explain. Well, there's our mathematical explanation. We can say no, they are not equivalent. Example 5. The ABC company produces bungee cords. When the manufacturing process is running well, the lengths of the bungee cords produced are normally distributed, with a mean of 45.2 cm and a standard deviation of 1.3 cm. Bungee cords that are shorter than 42 cm or longer than 48 cm are rejected by the quality control workers. Thank goodness. If 20,000 bungee cords are manufactured each day, how many bungee cords would you expect the quality control workers to reject? And B says what action might the company take as a result of these findings? Okay, so let's go through our data and pick out our mean and our standard deviations. We've got a mean here of 45.2 centimeters, standard deviation 1.3 centimeters, and it says shorter than 42 centimeters are rejected and longer than 48 centimeters are rejected. So we have a diagram that's going to go with this. First of all, our mean, I'll put it up here so I have more room, our mean is 45.2 centimeters, standard deviation is 1.3 centimeters. And we've got our diagram. So here's my mean. Now it says shorter than 42 and greater than 48. So that would mean everything shaded less than and up to 42 and everything greater than 48 centimeters. So what would that look like for our math? Well, we'd have to do normal CDF twice. Oops. We'd have to do it once for the 42. So that would go from negative E99 to 42 with a mean of 45.2 and a standard deviation of 1.3. And then we'd do it again going from 48 centimeters to E99 with the same mean and standard deviation. All right, so punching those into your calculator, you get 0 0.0069 and 0 0.0156. For a total, if we add those together, of 0 0.0225. Okay, so that means that 0 0.0225 is the area or the probability. But what does that mean in terms of the number of cords? Because it says if 20,000 bungee cords are manufactured each day, how many bungee cords would you expect them to reject? Well, we would have to take our 0 0.0225 value and multiply it by the 20,000 cords and we'll see that 450 cords are rejected. Alright, now you can make a decision here. It says what action might the company take as a result of these findings? Well, they might want to do a better job of how they're making these cords because if that many cords are in that range, that means that that's a lot of waste, 450 cords, right? So you might want to look at um, adjusting what you're doing, but you definitely don't want them
to start making the range bigger because they're going to be less safe, right? So you don't want to compromise the safety for what you're doing. You want to just make sure that the quality of what you're making falls within the right range. All right, let's take a look at example six. This is our last example for this lesson. A manufacturer of personal music players has determined that the mean life of the player is 32.4 months with a standard deviation of 6.3 months. What length of warranty should be offered if the manufacturer wants to restrict repairs to less than 1.5% of all the players sold? Okay, so we got to figure out what exactly this question is asking us to do. We can see that our mean is 32.4 months and our standard deviation is 6.3 months. But they're not asking us for a percentage. They're giving us the percentage. It says what length of warranty, so what score would correspond with, right, how many months should be offered if we want 1.5% um, to be the restriction for the repairs, right? So less than 1.5%. Well, if we draw this, we're always looking at things from a consumer point of view, but some of these questions are now asking us to look at things in terms of the manufacturer, in terms of the person selling. So this is your company. Well, okay, we've got a mean of 32.4 months, okay, and 1.5%. Well, 1.5% would correspond with an area of 0 0.015. So that's very, very small. Right? That would be somewhere in here. 0 0.015. So if we do this, we're doing inverse norm with an area of 0 0.015, a mean of 32.4 months, and a standard deviation of 6.3 months. Punching that into your calculator, you should see that you get an answer of 18.73. So that means 18.73 months, that's what this corresponds with, is when the warranty should be offered. Now if we want to look at rounding, I would probably round down in this case, so it would be an 18 month warranty. Alright, that's it for this lesson. Thanks for joining me today.